since we've done that, but I'll tell you what, let's turn to 859. 859, there's a song. Hold up your hand if you know it. I don't think there'll be any hands up. But this is a beautiful song. 859, we need to learn it. 859, anybody know it? Nope. Folks at home, do your best. <clears throat> 859. He paid a debt he did not owe. I owed a debt I could not pay. I needed someone to wash my sins away. And now I see a brand new song, amazing grace. Christ Jesus paid a debt that I could never pay. Sing the first verse again. He paid a debt he did not owe. I owed a debt I could not pay. I need sins away. And now I sing a brand new song, Amazing Grace. Christ Jesus paid a debt that I could never pay. Isn't that great? It was on his third and final missionary trip that the Apostle Paul was able to meet with the elders from the city of Ephesus in Asia. And the Apostle Paul made a statement to them. Of course, those of you who are regular Bible students realize that there was quite a bit that Paul spoke to concerning the future to the elders at Ephesus. But I want us to look at one particular verse that the Apostle Paul said to the elders at Ephesus, from Ephesus, Paul says, I have showed you all things, how that so laboring ye ought to support the weak, and to remember the words of the Lord Jesus, how he said, it is more blessed to give than to receive. Now, where Jesus was and when He made that statement is not revealed to us. We, we don't know. None of the four Gospel writers records Jesus making this statement. But by inspiration, the Apostle Paul is able to share with the elders from Ephesus words of Christ which have not been recorded in any of the four Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, or John. We by faith accept what Paul said. We realize that in the four Gospels, not everything that Jesus did, nor everything that Jesus said is recorded. Why, John himself writes that if everything Jesus did was recorded, he supposes that the world itself would not be able to hold the books that should be written. And so even though Matthew, Mark, Luke, or John don't tell us that Jesus said that, Paul does. And he was a man inspired by Almighty God. You know, it is, it is more blessed to give than receive. That, that's a phrase that I've heard all my life that I can remember, and I'm sure that you have too. The life of our Messiah and the existence of our Heavenly Father exhibit time after time just how good they've been to us. God is a beneficent God. He's loving, He's caring, He's kind, and He's giving. God's a giving God. 
James writes about that giving attitude of the Almighty in James 1, 17. He says that every good gift and every perfect gift is from above and cometh down from the Father of lights with whom there is no variableness, neither shadow of turning. Our Father's given us this great world to live in. Including all that's on the land, all that's on the seas. We have the sun, we have the moon, we have the stars, we have the animals, we have all the plant life that man needs. We have seed time, we have harvest time, we have the change of seasons, and certainly we have and owe our own existence to the fact that God is a giving God. He's given us life. The beneficence of Almighty God was ultimately, ultimately expressed when He gave His Son for us, for us in order that we could have our sins taken away. John 3.16, a verse you can quote, For God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son that whosoever believeth in Him should not perish but have everlasting life. Our giving God has provided us with His precious Word. That's something else He's given to us. It is able to instruct and, he, and guide us from earth to heaven. 2 Timothy 3, 16 and 17, the Bible tells us in all Scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine or reproof for correction for instruction in righteousness that the man of God may be perfect, complete, the best he can be, thoroughly furnished unto all good works. James in James 1.25, and this James is not the Apostle James, but rather is the physical brother of Jesus who did not become a believer in Jesus until he saw that his own physical brother, after having been crucified, was now alive again. The resurrection of Christ had proven to him that Jesus was indeed the Messiah, the Son of God, whom he had claimed to be. But James, in, in his book that he writes, James 1.25 describes the Word of God, which has been given to us by God, as the perfect law of liberty. In order to get this perfect law of liberty from God to mankind, God sent the Holy Spirit as a gift to man. The Apostle Peter writes in 1 Peter chapter 1 and verse 21, or 2 Peter chapter 1, in verse 21, he says, For the prophecy came not in old time to the will of man, but holy men of God spake as they were moved by the Holy Spirit. And so God, being the giving God that He is, not only has given us His Word, but in order to verify the accuracy of that Word, He sent the Holy Spirit down to give mankind that perfect Word of God. So although the Word of God originates with the Heavenly Father, the Holy Spirit was sent to introduce this Word of the, of the Father into the mind of man. We recognize that while Jesus lived upon the earth for that 33 and a half years that He walked among men, that He delivered the Father's Word and the Father's will to man. But the time came when Jesus was going to leave. 1 John chapter 14. Jesus tells His apostles that He's going to be leaving. You remember the first part of that chapter is the one where He says, If I go, I will come again and receive you unto Myself, so that where I am, there you may be also. But Jesus says, I'm leaving. But I'm not leaving you comfortless, Jesus says to His followers. He tells them that He's going to give them another Comforter. Jesus was the first comforter. He says to His followers, I'll give you another comforter when I'm gone. And in John 14, 17, He describes that comforter as the Spirit of truth, the Holy Spirit, who came to give the words of the Heavenly Father by directly guiding those who wrote, who wrote those words down in Holy Scriptures, a gift from God the Holy Spirit. 
You know, a lot of people do get utterly confused whenever they read Acts chapter 2 and verse 38. Those of you who are regular Bible students, again, recognize that verse. You've heard it. Who knows how many times in sermons that have been preached. Acts 2.38 is where Peter proclaimed, Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the remission of sins, and ye shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. And people look at that and they get confused. And a lot of people take that to mean, well, we're going to be getting some type of miraculous gifts. We're going to be able to speak in tongues. We're going to be able to interpret tongues whenever they're spoken. We might even be able to heal, a lot of people think, whenever they read that verse. Of course, we know that after the Bible was completely written and the, the Bible confirmed itself and there was no need for any miracles, to be performed by preachers or Christians to confirm that which they were saying. Mark chapter, chapter 16 and verse 20, the Lord, after He told His apostles to go, into, to go out and make disciples of all nations, remember, uh, Mark 16 is where He told them to go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. He that believeth and is baptized shall be saved. He that believeth not shall be damned. In verse 20 of that chapter, it ends up with saying that the Lord worked with them. With them who? Those who were going out to preach the Word. The Lord worked with them with signs following. The purpose of miracles was to confirm that whatever the preacher said was actually from God and not just from the preacher's own mind. Now that makes sense, doesn't it? That was before the Bible was written. That was before people could have the Bible to look at it and say, you know what? Baptism is what we need in order to have salvation. We'll prove it. Well, we today can take the Bible and open it up. Can we not? But back in those days, before the Bible was written, the preacher couldn't pull the Bible out of his hand and say, here's proof. He was able to perform a miracle, though, to prove that what he was saying was from God. Well, what is the gift of the Holy Spirit or Holy Ghost as spoken of in Acts chapter 2 and verse 38? Is it not the fruit that we're able to possess which was given to us by that Holy Spirit? Listen, people talk about the fruit of the Spirit. What is the fruit of the Spirit? Galatians chapter 5, verses 22 and 23 tells us very plainly what the fruit of the Spirit is. It says it's love, it's joy, it's peace, it's long-suffering, it's gentleness, it's goodness, it's faith, it's meekness, and it's temperance. These are the precious gifts that we're able to receive as we follow the Word of God and are obedient to those words as found in the Bible. we got a cherry tree at the house. Usually the birds get to it before we do. But you know what the gift of that cherry tree is to us? It's the fruit of the cherry, right? Any of you got any apple trees at home? What's the gift you get from the apple tree? Is it not the fruit of the apple tree? You plant corn, the corn grows, it gives you a gift. What does it give you? It gives you the fruit of the corn stalk. The fruit of that is the gift which is given to us. The fruit of the Spirit is the gift which we're able to get from it by reading and by obeying. Whenever Peter said that you shall receive the gift of the Holy Spirit, he was in effect saying you shall receive the fruit of the Holy Spirit. Love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, and so forth. Miraculous gifts, no, they come to an end. But these gifts have it so lutely. Since we have the Bible from men inspired of the Holy Spirit, then when we obtain those wonderful blessings in our lives by being guided by the Bible, we're getting the fruit or we're getting the gift of the Holy Spirit. All right. Let's get back to the idea that we've been given by God the Father and Christ the Son. God is a giving God. We've already seen that. We've seen some of the things which God has given us. Let's, let's look at what Jesus has given us too. Jesus has given us an example.
to follow. Many of us throughout our lives have been given examples as to the right way to do something. From 1969 to 1973, I was an apprentice electrician working alongside first class electricians. And I was able to see what they did and heard from them and being taught by them, I was able to learn how to correctly handle low to high voltage electricity. We have some wonderful cooks here in the congregation. Didn't come natural, did it? Chances are those of you who are wonderful cooks watched mom or grandma or someone else in your life prepare food and you followed their example. And so you were able to become a wonderful cook because you followed the example of others, other wonderful cooks. Well, listen. Jesus has given us an example to follow in order for us to live right in the sight of Almighty God. 2 Peter 2.21 The Bible tells us there very plainly that Jesus left us an example and then it says that we should follow in His steps. If you listen to the prayers that I lead, most of the time you'll hear me say, Help us to follow in the footsteps of Jesus because He is our example. Speaking of gifts, Christ gave His life as a gift in order to, re to redeem us. Speaking to the multitude who was following Him, Jesus said in Matthew 20, 28, Even as the Son of Man came not to be ministered unto, but to minister and to give His life a ransom for many. And certainly the, the, the gift that we're all looking forward to at the end of time, at the judgment day, we'll be able to go to that wonderful heavenly mansion that the Lord has gone to prepare. Amen. Jesus said in John 14, 3, I'll come again and receive you unto myself. Where I am, there you may be also. You know, really... The book of Psalms, chapter 145 and verse 9, sums it all up. There the psalmist by inspiration says, the Lord is good to all. He gives us all. He's the greatest gift giver. In light of God's love for us and His gifts to us, it would be inconceivable to even consider that we, His children, should not also be givers. God is the greatest giver. Jesus is a giver. The Holy Spirit is a giver. We, as children of God, also must be givers. A lot of people don't like to hear sermons on the idea of stewardship and giving. Taking care of the needs of others or giving to God on the first day of the week. Did you ever think, though, that over 20 of the parables of Jesus had to do with stewardship and giving? Jesus must have believed that it was important that we be givers. And that's why He spoke about it so much. If we follow in the footsteps of Jesus, if we're true worshipers of our gracious God, naturally, we'll want to be givers. Giving has always been an expression of love whether if you do it for your wife or do it for your child or you do it for Almighty God. In the book of Exodus chapter 36, we were able to read in our studies from the book of Exodus of the time whenever God wanted the tabernacle to be built. Israel's at the base of Mount Sinai. Moses had gone up on Mount Sinai. God had given him all the laws pertaining to the nation of Israel. And whenever Moses comes down from that Mount Sinai, he gives those laws to the people, and then he tells them another thing that God had commanded, it's time to build the tabernacle. Now you remember the tabernacle was that temporary structure. Before the temple was built in Jerusalem, they had the ta tabernacle. It was a portable structure that could be taken down and put back up in a day's time. It could be carried with them from place to place. But God said, I want the tabernacle to be built. And so Moses sent out word as to what was needed for the building of the tabernacle. He says, we need 
shittim wood or acacia wood, whichever way you want to call it. He said we need gold, we need silver, we need brass, we need cloth, we need animal hides, and we need precious stones. And whenever Moses gave those commands to the people of the things that were needed for the building of the tabernacle, the Bible says the people immediately went home and they got what they had, a lot of what they had, and they brought it right straight back to Moses so that the tabernacle could be built. And then the Bible says that every morning people would come bringing more and more and more for the building of the tabernacle until finally Moses had to tell them, we got too much. Stop giving. You have given more than what we need. We need to be giving people. We need to be giving people for God. It might be a selfish reason, but listen to what Jesus said in Luke 6 and verse 38. He said, Give, and it shall be given to you. Good measure, pressed down, shaken together, and running over, shall men give into your bosom. For with the same measure, measure that you meet, with all it shall be measured to you again. Through the Old Testament prophet Malachi, the minor prophet Malachi, God said, give to me and see if I won't open you the windows of heaven and pour you out a blessing that you'll not be able to receive it. One of the things that we can't act, that we can't do, we can't outgive God. You give to God, and God's going to give you more than what He has received from you. Listen, Christians are the church, aren't we? We are the church. First Timothy three fifteen says that the church, us, we, are the pillar and ground of the truth. In other words, the church props up the truth, the church supports the truth, we hold the truth high for others to see and learn. So what is truth? Well, that's the question Pilate asked Jesus. Remember, he said to Jesus, what is truth? Jesus answers that question in John 17, 17. In that beautiful prayer in the Garden of Gethsemane, Jesus prays to the Father and He says, sanctify them through Thy truth. Thy word is truth. Pilate said, what is truth? Well, the answer is the Word of God. The Word of God is that which is true. As the church, we should valiantly hold up that Word of God. That truth to a world that's being led into condemnation by false teachers and false preachers. Do you realize it's by truth that we've been saved? Do you realize that it's by truth that we've been born again? Do you realize that it's by truth that we've been adopted into the family of Almighty God? The church is to be engaged with teaching Christians all that they need to know to be rightful servants of God. In Matthew 28 and verse 20, after Jesus told His followers to make disciples of all nations, He continued and said that these ones who now were Christians were to be told all things whatsoever I have commanded you. As the church, we are commanded in Galatians 6 and verse 10, uh, as we have therefore opportunity, let us do good unto all men, especially those of the household of faith. I looked up that word good. What does it mean to do good to somebody? Does it mean you smile at them when you see them? Does it mean you wave at them? What does it mean to do good? Well, I, I looked up the word good, and the word good in the original language means to do things that are beneficial to others. If a man doesn't have clothing to wear, suitable clothing to wear, what would it mean to do good for him? Speak to him. Hey, how you doing? I'll pray for you. That would be a good thing to do. And I'll tell you what really would be a good thing to do. Getting clothing. Somebody's hungry, doesn't have food to eat. Oh, I pray that you get you a good job. I'll tell you what. Give him food. That, that would be beneficial to him. If a man is lost and not a Christian, what's the beneficial thing to do for him? Teach him about Jesus. That's the best thing that could be done. I've mentioned several things here, haven't I? Things that the church needs to be involved in, things that the church needs to be doing, needs to be spreading the gospel, it needs to be teaching those who are already Christians. 
It, may, it, it, it needs to be doing good for those who have need. You know what it takes to do all that? It takes money. It does. God knows that. And thus God has given commands and examples in His Word as to how this money is to be gathered. In 1 Corinthians 16, verses 1 and 2, we find a command that is given. Undoubtedly, the Apostle Paul had received a question from the church of Corinth concerning the collection for the saints. Now, Paul, we are to give, but we don't know exactly when, we don't know exactly how, we don't know exactly how much. Now that was just thrown in there, but we do know that Paul undoubtedly had received questions concerning the giving. And so Paul writes to the church of Corinth, Corinth concerning giving. He says, now concerning the collection for the saints, as I have given order to the churches of Galatia, even so do ye upon the first day of the week, let every one of you lay by him in store, as God has prospered him. And then in 2 Corinthians 9 and verse 7, we are able to read these words of the inspired writer when he says, Every man, according as he purposeth in his heart, so let him give, not grudgingly or of necessity, for God loveth a cheerful giver. Listen, since God loves a cheerful giver, and since we are all recipients of God's love, we should give cheerfully. Here's God's plan for our giving. Here it is. Number one, every child of God is to give. Number two, the giving is to be done on the first day of the week. But the church down the road had a yard sale on Thursday. The Bible says on the first day of the week, giving is to be done. But it doesn't say not to give it on Thursday. Yeah, it does. It tells you exactly what day to do it. He doesn't have to exclude Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday. Whenever he says do it on the first day, that, that excludes everything else. On the first day of the week, giving is to be done. Every child of God is to give as he or she has been prospered. That does away with the idea of tithing, doesn't it? We give as we have been prospered. We are to give willingly. We are to give cheerfully. We are to give to our Creator knowing how He's given to us. And finally, Finally, giving, giving must be done in love. If you hate to give to God, I'll tell you what, if you hate to give to God, then don't. Don't give. Because in all honesty, God, if you're not giving to God out of love, God doesn't want it. He wants us to love serving Him. We go back to 1 Corinthians chapter 13. Remember that's the love chapter of the Bible? And in 1 Corinthians chapter 12, the Apostle Paul had been dealing with the idea of the miracles that were taking place in the, in, in, within the congregation of Corinth. Some people could speak in tongues. Some people could interpret tongues. Some people could, could do miracles of, of healing. Some people had supernatural knowledge that was given to them of God. Paul says at the end of chapter 12, he says, Behold, I, so, I show you a better way. And then in chapter 13, he talks about what's better than gifts. Those miraculous gifts. He says love's better than those gifts. And he says this in verse 3 of 1 Corinthians 13. He says, Though I bestow all my goods to feed the poor, and though I give my body to be burned, and have not charity love, it profits me nothing. Nothing. Give to God in love. Listen, was this lesson designed because members of the church here are not giving? No, 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 don't even think that. Absolutely not. Many of the members are giving very unselfishly. This lesson was merely designed to remind us all of a very important biblical fact. Giving's a part of worship to God. Just as singing is, just as taking the communion is, just as prayer is, just as preaching is. Let's, let's just all continue to make sure that our worship is done in spirit and in truth. God's a giver to us. Let's be a giver to God and to a lost world and those who have need.
Today, if you're here and you're not a child of God, make this the day that you become His child. He's given so much to you. Don't you want to give to Him? If you're here and not a Christian, make this the day that you're baptized for the remission of sins. If you're here and you're an erring child of God, make this the day that you come back so you can give to your Creator. The invitation joins if you're subject to it. Won't you come? Someday you'll stand at the bar, wrong heart. Someday your record you'll see.